Okay, uh, hello. Um, unlike uh, the presentations, which uh, you just watched, uh, which were um, pre-recorded due to COVID, um, we're here now live for the question and answer session. Um, obviously, we wish we were there live for the entire thing, but unfortunately, we're coming to you from our houses. Um, but I'd like to begin by introducing um, the, the panel, which is uh, Darla Castelli from uh, the University of Texas, who you just heard speak, um, Karen Adolph from uh, uh, NYU, New York University, uh, Neiman Khan from the University of Illinois, and uh, myself, Chuck Hillman from uh, Northeastern University in Boston. And so uh, with that, I'd like to begin with some questions uh, that you guys have asked of us. And uh, to begin, I'm gonna, um, I'm going to throw a question to Naman, who's who was asked uh, for for preschool age children um, for cognitive development uh, to begin properly. What type of nutritious meals are required? Thank you, Chuck. Uh, I just want to mention, uh, just say, uh, happy to be here, and uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with the group. Uh, as far as the question uh, regarding the quality of meals uh, and uh, you know, cognitive development in, in preschool children. Uh, we don't actually know a lot uh, from randomized control trials. In general, the area of nutrition and cognitive function, particularly when you look at preschool and school age children, is, is limited. Um, and that extends uh, beyond limitations even further when you, when you try to think about mixed meals. So what we know is that uh, what we know more of is about particular nutrients like DHA and lutein. Uh, choline, but what we don't really know is about the, the effect of mixed meals. Uh, what we do know from some of the work that's been done in uh, carbohydrate uh, studies is that, uh, you know, providing children with, uh, and even breakfast studies, is that providing children with breakfast or a source of, uh, uh, you know, easily absorbable carbohydrates uh, may be uh, impactful, uh, particularly for children who tend to skip uh, breakfast, and that may be impactful in terms of their short-term or acute cog cognitive function, but uh, you know, the long-term implications are not quite well understood. Thank you, uh, Naman. Um, next, uh, it looks like um, we have a question for Karen, who uh, was asked, you mentioned back sleeping can decrease uh, SIDS. Uh, do you have any RCT data if so, please share with us. There's no, to my knowledge, there's no randomized control trials for, you know, that position babies in, um, in different ways and then sees if they die. <laughs> um, so um, there are prospective studies, um, which means that they track babies going forward and there's retrospective studies where they ask parents at later points the positions that their infants slept in. Um, and um, some parents, so now, you know, it's pretty universal that pediatricians are recommending that babies be put to sleep on their backs. Um, um, but some parents still put infants to sleep on their, on their bellies. Um, and so it's possible to see whether there's a difference in um, the incidence of sudden infant death syndrome, but um, more likely is that um, it's possible to see whether the, there's a relation between time on the belly and time on the back and when infants, um, the ages at which infants acquire different um, motor skills, so skills um, prone are delayed for babies that don't spend awake time on their bellies. And, um, and in some cases, they found that even upright skills are delayed for babies who um, don't spend awake time on their bellies. So the relation between back sleeping or belly sleeping and motor skills is because if you put a baby, you know, down, um, in whatever position, there's a little while before the baby falls asleep. And if the baby can't roll into, you know, can't choose for themselves whether to be prone or supine, um, um, when they wake up, there's a little bit of time when they're on their bellies or on their backs. Um, and so there are good prospective data now to show that putting babies um, on their bellies when they're awake 
it's related to earlier onset ages, younger onset ages for prone skills, like pushing up, um, propping up in a prone position, um, prone and reaching, rolling, um, and crawling. Thank you, Karen. Um, Darla, this question just came in. So since you spoke last, I'll assume it's for you. That is, what type of physical activity is recommended for obese children? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks, Chuck, for the question. Um, and thank you to the organizing committee for um, everything that has gone on behind the scenes and, and pulling off this conference. Uh, I appreciate your efforts. So when we're talking about um, engagement and physical activity for, you know, children who have a body mass indices that suggest that they are obese um, and in an un in unhealthy state, um, we have to be careful about those weight bearing activities. And so the notion of, you know, high impact aerobics um, can really start to wear and tear on the joints. Um, I think the best thing for children who um, fall into this category is the notion of establishing a, a positive rapport with the child, talking to them about their interests, how they want to begin their engagement with physical activity. The most important thing is to move from sedentary lifestyle into engagement and light physical activity, and then to tolerance on moderate to vigorous physical activity. And a lot of times the motives are about supports and friendships and interests and all of these other things uh, that are social determinants and supports of their engagement. So I would recommend whatever the child is of interest, uh, has an interest in, um, is to try to get them to engage in that. And sometimes it starts as simple as you know, walking your dog to the mailbox, walk as a family, um, providing uh, family engagement and parent modeling of that physical activity. So things um, that are have minimal impact um, and are not of a very high intensity uh, are physical activities that I would recommend. If the child's interested in dance, um, I think that's a hidden way uh, to try to have that motive, uh, whatever type of music genre that they enjoy, uh, get them to engage in that dance if at all possible. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Darla. Um, let's see, the next question is for me, how much physical activity is, uh, how much physical activity in relation to intensity, duration, and frequency is needed? That's a great question. Um, and, and that's something that uh, during my time on the uh, physical activity guidelines for Americans scientific advisory committee, um, we spoke a lot about, and, and the guidelines have pretty much remained unchanged for the last uh, really 12 years now, uh, which recommends uh, that children receive 60 minutes or more of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day of the week. Um, but that's only part of the story. That, that's, if that's your take home message, that's fine. But, but really it goes beyond that um, in that kids should also engage in part of that time uh, during the week in bone and muscle loading exercises. Um, and a committee that, that Darla and I served at the Institute of Medicine suggested that, that actually schools should be responsible for half that time. I mean that each school day, children should receive at least 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity uh, in school. And that the other 30 minutes uh, could be acquired outside of school, either uh, on the way to school or home, if they actively commute, or through uh, some form of physical activity such as play or, or engagement in sports or, or whatnot. Um, but, but I guess, uh, you know, one of the problems we have is that most kids, at least in the United States, and we know this in most Western cultures, don't even come close. And so it really falls on, uh, you know, both parents and school teachers and, and school districts to uh, ensure that kids engage in more, in the recommended amount of physical activity. Uh, which is a minimum, again, of 60 minutes or more moderate figures physical activity. And, and lastly, let me say that, that that doesn't have to come in one big shot. Um, it can be uh, provided intermittently throughout the school day. So uh, let's see. Naman, let's go back to you. Um, I'm trying to manage both of these uh, documents here. Uh, and I have a question for you related to DHA and its relationship to brain health. Um, and so maybe you could uh, elaborate on that uh, relationship, please. 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think you know DHA, of course, is an essential nutrient that's uh, vital for both physical and uh, cognitive development. Uh, what the literature says, at least mostly that's done in DHA, uh, it's focused more on visual development. And uh, we know early on in life that DHA, uh, either even provided as a perinatal uh, supplement or early in life, um, you know, tends to promote visual development uh, in infants. Uh, we have limited literature on cognitive development. Much of it has focused on IQ as the primary outcome. And there is some suggestion that the, uh, DHA in early life and uh, even breastfeeding, for example, uh, could be linked to uh, a higher IQ, but really not a large effect size. In most, in often cases, those effects are mediated by uh, compounding factors like socioeconomic status. Uh, and beyond uh, infancy, uh, the literature on school-age children is actually pretty mixed. It it goes back to you know the the old saying about you know sort of nutrition, uh, you know you have to think about the population you're actually supplementing with that really drives these effects. So the literature in older children suggests that uh, not, every, not all children tend to benefit from DHA supplementation. Uh, that tends to be, uh, those effects tend to be larger in children who are typically consuming, under consuming DHA or tend to have uh, inadequate diets in terms of essential nutrients. So children that tend to have some nutritional deficiencies tend to benefit to a greater extent, uh, you know, following provision of DHA, but we don't see that uh, across the board for all children. Thanks, Naman. Um, Karen, back to you. There's a question here on, uh, do motor, are, are motor skills influenced by uh, social exposures? Uh, if so, can you, uh, the, the question really relates to, are they more influenced by so, social exposures? exposure, so I'm assuming that means relative to maybe genetic influences. Can you mm. pair them against each other? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. So there's, um, there's very good evidence that motor skills, you know, broadly, um, actually, I love this question. There's lots of evidence that motor skills writ broadly are influenced by social factors. And there's some evidence that social factors are more important than genetic factors. So um, for the first part of this, um, this is like any kind of motor skill. Um, and so social interactions can influence which skills children acquire and the ages at which they acquire them and how you know well they can perform the skills. So it's absolutely true or things that you would think of as being culturally specific, like whether a child can use chopsticks or you know play ball sports or um, skip. <laughs> um, but it's also true for basic skills, like the positions in which children sit or squat or the ages at which they walk or whether or not they crawl. Um, and then, um, um, in terms of whether social skills are more important than genetic factors, um, there's one really nice study by Brian Hopkins um, that showed that, well, that compared um, three groups of families who were living in Britain. So one group were um, white families that were sort of, you know, already living in Britain. And then the two other groups were Jamaican families who had immigrated to Britain. All three groups had the same prenatal care, the same access to, you know, um, medical care, same, you know, SES and um, similar living conditions and so on. From the two Jamaican groups, um, both of them came from a culture where um, parents deliberately exercise sitting and upright skills um, where they expect that babies will sit and walk um, based on their social interactions, their, you know, like physical manipulations of the baby. So they think about sitting and walking the same way you might think about reading or potty training, that children won't learn that unless you actually, you know, deliberately teach them to, you know, sit on a potty or to, um, you know, read, you know, read words on a page. Um, 
So one of these Jamaican groups assimilated and no longer performed um, exercise and massage, and the other group continued to perform the skills in their culture. And the group that continued to perform the skills of their culture achieved sitting and walking at an earlier age than the group with, you know, presumably the same um, genetic background, at least the same racial background. Um, so um, it showed that exercise is, you know, that, 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 that that these culturally specific exercises accelerated the onset of sitting and walking. Um, and, you know, just as a, a I know, additional point, um, uh, the Jamaican culture at that point, at that time, um, didn't value crawling as a skill for babies to do. And so children were actively discouraged from crawling and um, presumably as a consequence, children began crawling at about the same age or even later than when they began walking. So um, there's evidence that crawling is absolutely not an obligatory skill. It's just a solution that, you know, most infants in most places discover just as they can discover bum shuffling and scooting and lots of other ways to move. Um, it's a temporary solution before they can walk. So yeah, social interactions are absolutely um, part and you know integral to motor skill acquisition, both really basic skills and you know high level skills, sports skills, dance skills, um, using artifacts, and so on. Love that question. Thanks, Karen. So it sounds like you you place nurture as high up there as nature, maybe more so. Okay. Um, so Darla, how can health behaviors be established in a, in a school? Well, I, I love the way that you mentioned this notion of schools being responsible for 50% of that 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous uh, physical activity each day. Um, I think schools are a microcosm of society and it takes a village to raise a child. So um, our broader panel network and the work that we do, it would draw on all of those entities. So for example, in school, we need to have healthy choices for eating. We need to have healthy options um, to move our bodies. And so within the school, it takes this comprehensive effort where we're establishing health first policies. Um, we are avoiding obesogenic or sedentary environments where it's okay for teachers to have physical activity embedded in their lesson within the classroom. We have opportunities for imaginative learning, um, theatrics, uh, we have opportunities for structured play, and then we have the notion of after school, we have programs that um, motorically refine our movement and provide that competition for those uh, children who would like to engage in that. That's a comprehensive effort in it would be great if our school day, as Chuck had suggested, um, ultimately begins with this act of transportation, that we have safe routes to school, and then we have a healthy meal when we get to school, and then across the curriculum, we have embedded opportunities to move our bodies. And sometimes when I do professional development, I, I hear from teachers that we don't want to use the word wiggle or we don't want to use the word stretch because I might lose control of my classroom. And I'm here to say that normal and typical development and children are actually eager to engage in that form of movement. So stretch your minds and stretch your bodies within that classroom. I love how Karen just said that it is about the opportunity to explore the environment. Doesn't matter how you explore it, you know, whether you crawl or creep within that environment. The fact is you had a chance to put your hands in the child had their chance put their hands in the grass and to feel that grass and to figure out how to transport from one place to another to get that object that they wanted. It's just at a slightly different developmental stage when we're talking about schooling. Children still need these opportunities to explore their environment um, and to thrive within that environment. And I would argue that that involves some form of human movement across the curriculum. Thanks, Starla. 
Yeah, you touch on a really good point that it's it's funny from an adult perspective. You know, we ask children to do things in school that we don't do ourselves, right? Sit still, don't <laughs> forget, stay on task for you know long stretches of time. When we all know now, working from home, we we take our little micro breaks and check the news or sports and get up and go get a coffee and all those sorts of things. So, um, okay, so I guess the next question is for me, and that is: Is only aerobic exercise uh, related to improvements in cerebral development in kids? Uh, and, and I would answer absolutely not. Um, what I'll tell you is, is that we know the most about aerobic exercise. That is to say, we know the most about aerobic forms of physical activity, walking, running, uh, biking, and whatnot, and its effects on brain structure, brain function, cognition, and academic performance. Um, but there are, there are certainly other modes of physical activity. Um, we know that motor skill building has, um, has a, a, a separate or a unique relationship with uh, cognitive and academic performance. Um, in, in older adults, we know that uh, strength training, a randomized controlled trial strength training uh, is related to changes in, in both brain structure and function as well as uh, cognition. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, what, what I would caution you on is there are certain groups out there that suggests that there's only one type of exercise uh, or, or, or another type of exercise that are important. And that's just simply not true. When you, when you look through the entire literature, uh, there are many ways to get there. There are many ways to derive benefit. Uh, and, and what we know is that, is that may, what we know the most about is aerobic exercise. And so certainly I think that's a good place to start. That's the foundation um, for other forms of exercise. But, but certainly we, uh, we do know that there are other types of exercise that also benefit uh, uh, brain and cognition. So with that, uh, Naman, I'm gonna ask you, uh, there's a couple questions that are all very similar. So uh, let me at least ask you two of them or, or three of them and you can see if, uh, you know, how you wanna answer it. And one is, you know, does malnutrition affect brain growth and size? Um, and another is what types of nutrition are best for, uh, for brain health uh, and cognition? Um, and, and then there's even, you know, what kind of nutrition do we need to give growing children faster brain function? So I, I think, you know, you can answer this as, as you like, but they're, they're all kind of the same body of questions. Uh, so they're all great questions and uh, I think very, really important. Uh, when we think about early life and we talk, when we talk about deficiency in any, nutri any nutrient, uh, I think it's important to understand that um, you know, in, when it comes to essential nutrients, uh, you know, when you talk about macronutrients like DHA or we're talking about uh, micronutrients, uh, you know, like vitamin D and zinc, these are essential nutrients that uh, are really important for laying a foundation for uh, brain development and brain growth. So I think deficiencies in any essential nutrient uh, result in direct impact on brain growth, uh, but also uh, when you think about what deficiencies do in terms of uh, you know, motor development, in terms of uh, physical development also could compromise you know, uh, cognitive benefits that you'd see from you know, environmental enrichment, engagement in the environment. So <clears throat> I think it's important to recognize that certainly, you know, nutrition is vital uh, in setting the base in terms of brain structure and function in early life. Um, and uh, a lot of that development takes place uh, you know, early on uh, if you're doing fetal development and then the first couple of years of, uh, of life. Uh, and then it, you know, obviously continues all the way until uh, the third decade as far as pruning and uh, of synapses and that sort of thing. So at all these stages, uh, the effects of nutrition can play varying roles and depending on the nutrients that are somebody's deficient in those effects could be larger uh, in certain domains. Um, and what we don't know as much ab about is really the, you know, the complementary nutrients that are not called essential. So for the case of choline, uh, in the case of lutein, for example, is a nutrients that are still being understood in terms of deficiency. They don't always, you know, we don't have well-characterized deficiency criteria for these nutrients, but we know that uh, they may play uh, an important role in optimizing cognitive development beyond uh, addressing issues of um, you know, deficiency, particularly in children who don't have any deficiencies. So we know that nutrition plays a vital role uh, in brain development and function. Uh, I think that the two questions were about uh, you know, nutrition in sort of daily cognitive functioning and what would be considered to be helpful nutrition in, the, in, in that context. Uh, you know, what we're learning from cross-sectional studies and these little uh, and randomized control trials in this area 
uh, is that you know healthful nutrition in terms of supporting uh, a lot of other uh, you know, health domains uh, plays an important role even in cognitive function. So, for example, uh, a diet that's uh, you know rich in uh, in, uh, in, in micronutrients, in vitamins and minerals, uh, a diet that's rich in green leafy vegetables, uh, a diet that's varied in its patterns in terms of balance uh, of all these different nutrients could play a, a really important role. I think much of that literature has been captured by research on uh, diet quality. Uh, we know this in older adults. Uh, for example, Mediterranean diet patterns have been shown in older adults to be protective or neuroprotective in later life. We're learning that similar patterns may be beneficial, particularly those in, that include dietary fiber, uh, as, a, as a nutrient source, as well as a healthier profile of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids in the diet um, in children as well. So I think that, you know, as we think a little broader in terms of dietary patterns, there may be some uh, important lessons there as well. Thanks, Naman. Um, I'm going to move back to Karen here. And a question that just came in asks, uh, uh, if parents are restricting movements and activity, uh, based on risky environments uh, in their kids, will this have long-term implications uh, or, or future problems? Um, I, I, yeah, what an important question. I, I assume this has to do with COVID. Um, for infants, just allowing babies to move around indoors in the safe environment of their home, um, all the evidence we know of um, indicates that that should be sufficient. The older the child, I think the more um, important it is to find environments where they can do the kinds of large movements that are so important. And the older the child, the more their motor skills are interact with social interactions beyond just interacting with the caregiver. Um, so all the things that Darla was saying are super, super important. We don't know what the effects of, um, you know, homeschooling such a large swath of children around the world is going to do. And, um, and nobody knows what, you know, what the effects of restricted movements are going to be like. Um, but in my presentation, I um, showed some data from um, cultures in Central Asia where babies um, spend, you know, sometimes up to 20 hours a day bound from neck to toe in a special Gavora cradle. And that binding restricts all of the infant's movements. They can't even turn their heads. So really all they could move are their fingers and their toes. Um, and the, the onset ages are delayed relative to Western norms relative to the World Health Organization um, standards. But Western norms and the World Health Organization standards were not normed on you know, babies from Central Asia. So there's something you know, kind of ironic or perverse about comparing infants to a, like a so-called standard or a norm where they weren't, they weren't part of it. So, um, and, you know, as, as you all know, people in Central Asia <laughs> um, grow up to be just fine. In fact, by preschool age, um, our lab was finding that children, you know, are um, doing some skills that, um, you know, you don't normally see in Western cultures, children walking over narrow bridges, you know, as part of their everyday environment and climbing high ladders. Um, and so on. And there's other data like that, like the Aceh Indians in Paraguay, um, in eastern Paraguay, um, when they were studied in the 1980s, they weren't walking until they were 20 plus months of age, which is seemed like off the chart for um, Western norms. But by the time those kids were um, you know, eight, 10 years old, they were climbing high trees and using machetes and doing all kinds of motor skills that children in Western cultures can't do by those ages. And for some of us, you know, by, by no, no age, you know, how can we climb a high tree, <laughs> machetes and so on. Um, so, you know, I think the, the real question is what's going to happen to this whole generation of children around the world whose um, movements, their social interactions, their everyday lives are so disrupted by COVID. And you know, this is 
just, these are disruptions across the board. I would worry far less for little babies and far more the older the children. Um, and one, you know, one last word is, you know, those of us who are um, teach college students or have, you know, children who are in high school um, or in college, you know, it's really, really hard for them. And, you know, I, I, like developmentally, college age children really maybe shouldn't have returned to their childhood bedroom and, you know, camping in with their parents for weeks and months on end. Um, so I think this is sort of a natural experiment, um, but the outcomes, you know, may not, may not be what we hope they are. So, thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, Darla, back to you for one more question. Which, which of the health factors discussed there are most important for school children to perform well at sc in school? Um, well, just to clarify, Jack, what do you, when, which health factors are you making reference to? I would imagine that we're talking about probably nutrition versus physical activity behaviors. Ah, okay. So Naman and I can debate this one. Um, I, I don't think it's prioritized one or the other, right? I think it's opportunities to do both. Um, so I'm going to sit right on the fence and I'm going to say um, both physical activity um, and healthy eating are practices uh, that we need to promote. Um, but children need opportunities to make these decisions um, on their own. So exposure to um, I'm going to eat a star fruit or fruits and vegetables that I've never had before. Um, versus uh, the French fries that I'm being offered at lunch, right? So we need to provide these opportunities for children in a safe space to practice making those healthy decisions so when they're on their own, um, they continue and sustain those healthy choices. Um, I, I was going to kind of elaborate, Chuck, on the five components of a comprehensive uh, physical activity program, which does have um, nutrition at heart as well. But there's five points of intervention, and those five points of intervention one is compulsory physical education is the formalized instruction and education surrounding human movement um, surrounding making healthy choices and what are your options and how to understand those second point of intervention is the notion of before and after school physical activity so we've already um, touched on the notion of active transportation to school still promoting uh, uh, sport activity um, and uh, opportunities in after school programming for children to move. So it's not just after school homework that we're doing or not not just after school care providing, but opportunities for movement um, after school as well. And the third component of that is the notion of physical activity during academic lessons. So getting out of your chair, going to the board, using humans as manipulatives as part of learning to understand um, the content that's being presented. Um, the, la the last two, um, one is centered around staff involvement, and that's the notion I touched on earlier about it takes a village to raise a child. So the custodial workers, the administrators, um, the nutrition service providers, this is all a comprehensive effort where we are also thinking about the wellness of a adults in that environment. I think they get left out of this equation. And so conscientiously having um, uh, some occupational wellness opportunities, um, those teachers with uh, who are healthy probably have a better executive functions, um, you know, to be continued on this discussion uh, about uh, future research about the executive functions of teachers and their health habits, right? So addressing the health needs of staff um, in that community uh, and caring for our teachers as well as caring for our children. The last one is the notion of community engagement. Schools can't be a community in and of itself and function in isolation. They have to be well connected um, to opportunities within the community and, and whether that is, um, again, engagement in youth sport program, access to green space, um, rails and trails, um, programming that's offered for adult parenting or nutrition classes, just 
the school having this purposeful connection. Um, and often we have a champion who does that um, within schools in the United States. Sometimes they're called um, community liaisons. Sometimes they are called a community champion, but someone purposefully making, identifying and making those connections for both parents to be engaged in the curriculum and for school to be taken out into the broader community. So I think those five points of intervention, Chuck, are really important. And then within there, you can address um, both physical activity uh, and nutrition as health behaviors. Thanks, Darla. Um, and actually, I think that probably leads into our last question of the day, which is for me, which uh, it asks, um, if children and adolescents stop uh, exercising, um, what are the long-term implications uh, in adulthood? And that is, you know, do they continue to have benefits for cognition? And so, you know, as you spoke about teachers and their executive function, um, one thing that several of our lecturers talked about is that physical activity improves executive functioning. And fortunately, what we know is that while uh, this is true in kids, this is also true in adults and older adults. And in fact, there's more data in older adults uh, than there are uh, in, in children. And so uh, to that end, um, when, we, when we stop physical activity, uh, we, we do stop receiving the benefits of it, meaning it's a use it or lose it uh, scenario for, for both brain and, and cognition. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I guess for all, for all of the audience who spent the last couple of days in their chair, sitting there listening to lectures, and we thank you for that, um, it is time to get up and move because it does benefit you. Uh, the way it benefits uh, your children. And so uh, with that, uh, I'm going to end our Q&A session and I'm going to turn uh, the, the floor, the virtual microphone back over to um, uh, Natalia Wegman, who uh, is going to close the session today. Thank you for your time. Dear Charles, dear faculty, thank you very much for a fantastic session and great questions and answers. We didn't have enough time to answer all questions we came, which came during the session. And uh, I, uh, to participants, I really can ensure you that we will make effort and faculty will reply on those questions which are still remaining unanswered. What I would like to do now, I would like to summarize in three words the session which um, we had today. It was maybe a little bit unusual for the Nestle Nutrition Institute because most of the time we are talking about nutrition. We are not really talking about, you know, physical activity, motor skill development, and uh, how much it may influence brain and cognitive functions. And that was understand that it's very important to, to touch, especially when we are talking about period of life, like toddlers in the young preschool children, where we really do set up a foundation for healthy life. And uh, Charles Hillman, he, he, he set up this, the, the, this, the base for this session by explaining that it's true that uh, uh, our children uh, are not physically active as much as we would like or they have to be. And there's a different reasons to that. And understand what is, the, what is the link between the physical activity and brain development and cognition. It's not easy because you need to have a good randomized uh, research uh, trials on that. And again, it's not very easy to do that in young children for, for multiple reasons. So most of the uh, uh, research which has been discussed today, it was about the young uh, schoolers uh, and uh, a little bit older school children. However, when, when uh, Naima moved us to another section of, of, of this um, uh, session about brain and cognition and physical activity and potential role of nutrition, it's very clear that certain, first of all, adequate nutrition is very important. And if, if, if child is getting adequate nutrition, that potentially his brain will be developed in, in the way it has to be. But certain nutrients, they're playing maybe more important role and they're triggering more certain, certain parts of uh, developmental brain and, and uh, cognition than the others. So it's important to take in consideration, but definitely more research is needed. And uh, what was very important, one of the questions when Nyman elaborated about DHA, he pointed that that's, it's true. This is nutrient which has probably a lot of potential and, and more needs to come. And then, and then with, the, with the Karen, we moved to a very young age of, of motor skills development when child just come into this world and start to investigate this world by different means. And one which is the most important, that's the, the, 
the experience which he is uh, trying to understand this world. We all know, and we pediatricians, we know that there is a certain, you know, standard scheme in which months and which week child has to do certain motor movements, but it's not uniform and not the age, but mostly the experience which child has is giving him a possibility to develop. Therefore, it's very important for us as a pediatricians and for us as a parent or grandparents, it's very important to understand that we have to be busy with our children and grandchildren. We have to help them to, 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 to discover this world. And then our children are going to school. And uh, in a big part of the world, we parents believe that now school is responsible for children, for everything what is happening with children. And, and that's, uh, Darla explained us very well that Yes, school is responsible and there is a lot of opportunity to do the good things at school when we are talking about the physical activity and when we are talking about the healthy eating habits. And, uh, but this is not easy. This, this requires a very strong strategic approach. This requires a trained, very well trained personnel. And in this case, teachers are playing a super important role. So they need to take a big part of that and they have to be a passionate, they have to, to, to want to change the situation and they have to engage with children in that. So with this, I think that this session was absolutely great. And uh, it was a very great closing to the three days of the Nestle Nutrition Institute workshop when we were talking about the toddlers and important milestones in their development. What is still a big question I, I think is remaining open, what exactly the role of nutrition in different parts of the developmental outcomes? We know a lot and we still don't know, maybe even more. So more to come and uh, I'm looking forward for the next sessions in upcoming times, maybe a, a better times when we can engage really in, uh, in, the, in the time uh, without just online, um, online and virtual events. And I wish to all of you as a faculty, all participants who, who, who took their time to spend with, uh, with the Nestle Nutrition Institute to stay healthy and, um, and stay tuned with the Nestle Nutrition Institute. Thank you very much. And um, with this, till the next meeting with NNI. Bye.